Oh, hello. Is that Sparks Radio Stores? Well, this is Mrs. Brown of the Nest Ridgeway Terrace. That's right. Well, now, it's my radio. It keeps on going on and off. Oh, no, it's on at the moment, but there's a switch or something wrong. Yes, but it might go off altogether. Can you send someone? You're what? You'll try. Well, that wouldn't be any good because, you see... Oh. And that is what I wish to impress on you all. That electricity can ease the housewife's work in so many different ways. Have you ever stopped to think how, by the mere touch of a switch, invisible servants come to your aid? The use of electricity is undoubtedly a marvellous thing. After all, when you come to think of it, what would we do without electricity? As for the future... Electricity, these men never been in the kitchen in their lives, most of them. Touch of the switch, I ask you. Come in. <gasps> Who are you? Faraday is the name, ma'am. Oh, you must be the electrician. I suppose I might call myself an electrician. You've been very quick in getting here. Time means very little to me, ma'am. I suppose you've been doing this job for quite a while. For quite a long while. Oh, well, now you are here, you might as well look at the radio. You'll be able to see it better if you switch on that table lamp. What an amazing light. Oh, there's only utility. Utility? But that... It's the radio that needs looking at. It keeps on stopping for no reason at all. I would never have believed it. That orchestra might be in the next room. Get something brighter, do. The other knobs for tuning. And indeed, so many people today take this miracle of electricity for granted. It is a wonder that such great pioneers of the past, as our own Michael Faraday, for example, do not return from the grave to reproach us, as well they might. Of course, there isn't anything supernatural about electricity. It all began in a very simple way with this simple apparatus, which Faraday invented in 1831. A magnet moved, and an electric current flowed through a coil of wire. Did Faraday the man who induced that first current along a little coil on his laboratory table realized that within a hundred years it would flow through the world, becoming an industry that has changed all industry, a science that has affected all science, a power that has tapped the source of all power, penetrating the atom and splitting the very substance of the world itself. Into all our lives, into every part of the world, wherever these ships may sail, the electric current flows. There's no need to go with the ship to find it. It's there on board, ready at the flick of a switch to pass through miles of cable, carrying light and power, arctic cold and tropical heat to the various instruments and apparatus in every part of the ship. When the ship is ready to cast off, electricity flows into the motors, bringing power to the great rudder. It flows into the lounges and cabins, bringing warmth and light to passengers and crew. It flows into the ship's galleys, taking heat to cook the food and icy cold to preserve it. And it flows into the instruments that control and navigate her, into this gyro compass that will keep the ship on her true bearing. Into the radio, and radar that will guide her through darkness and fog until she reaches port again. 
And the men of the shipyard who have worked on the ship, they know that she will sail a steady course through calm and storm and that their job is well done. This man is an electrician. He knows more about electricity than most of us. And yet, even he sees only a small part of the picture. He knows his own job. He probably knows something about some of the jobs that electricians elsewhere are doing. But to see the bigger picture, we must follow this letter to this house, which is owned by the Electrical Trades Union. In these offices, the affairs of 140,000 electrical workers are looked after. Here you will find people who have a good idea of the importance and size of the job that electricity is doing in the world today. My job in these offices, or one of them, is to look after a filing system which contains the names of all these 140,000 electricians. It's true that most of them know they're in a big industry, but when you've been looking after a file like this as long as I have, you begin to realize just how big it is. Not that you need much time to find that out. You've only got to take a handful of names at random out of here and see the kind of work they're doing, and you've got a pretty fair cross-section of the industry. I'll show you what I mean. Now, to start with, Here's one of our 35,000 members in the supply side of the industry. Wherever electric power is being generated, you'll find them. They're obviously key men in the electrical scheme of things. Without them, we might as well shut up shop. On the work of these men depends the work of all the rest of the army of electricians in the various branches of the electrical industry. Now, here's one of 15,000 workers who come under the general heading of light electrical engineering. That's a pretty big field. And this girl is making elements for electric cookers. It's not a very spectacular job. The wire is heated to make it pliable, stretched to the correct length, and it's ready for the hot plate. Then the hot plate is filled with insulating paste, which hardens and keeps the element in position. Another simple job done by women. Most of this finicky repetition work in light electrical engineering is done by women who have the skill and speed that's needed for it. And of course, it's the women of Britain who will know how to use these cookers when they're complete. Oh, sorry, export only. The greater part of the goods now being turned out by the light electrical industry are at the moment for housing programs or export. The coils these girls are winding, for instance, they'll go into radio sets for overseas. But production is well underway, and the workers who became skilled mass-producing radar sets at top speed for the services are working just as hard now supplying peacetime needs. At the moment, their skill is helping to pay for food imports. But before long, it will be used on goods for the home market. Not only radio sets will be coming back, but things the housewife has forgotten, or remembers only in her dreams, like these washing up machines, and these electric wash tubs. Even those who know nothing of the story of electricity in industry or science know what it means to the housewife. It will destroy the drudgery of housework. Food refrigeration isn't new. But new ideas in processing and storage will lead to big changes in the food industry. This is freshly cooked roast chicken. It's wrapped in cellophane and with other cooked foods is on its way to a tunnel where the temperature is kept by electricity as low as 20 degrees below freezing. When the freezing process is complete, this food can be kept in ordinary cold store until it's needed. And it doesn't matter if it isn't needed for years. It can be kept for years. Yes, that suggests all kinds of possibilities, doesn't it? This crude, as it's called, is destined for airliners 
It's packed when wanted and dispatched in special containers. The perfect answer to air travel food problems. All meals on British South American Airways, for example, are prepared in this simple way. The food is stored in the aircraft refrigerator, then taken out and placed in tins. And this, by the way, is braised beef. You don't have to prepare or cook it. The ready-made meals are simply heated in ovens for a certain time, and then they're ready to eat. Housewives may not be very interested in the saving of space and weight that is so important in aircraft, but they will be enthusiastic about the idea of having foods out of season, and even more so over not having to prepare and cook them. Well, what you've just seen covers what most people think of when they think of electricity. Gadgets to make life easier and more pleasant, and all very fine too, but we've only scratched the surface. Let's see what we've got here. Here's one of our members in uh, heavy electrical engineering. This is the big stuff. They work on what you might call the raw materials for supplying power to industry. The manufacture of machinery and equipment for generating and distributing electricity is an industry in itself, a heavy industry, in which, of course, wherever you go, you'll find electricians. You may find them at work on a giant power station generator like this. It weighs 80 tons. It revolves 3,000 times a minute. There are over 12 miles of copper strip in the windings of this generator, which have to be strongly bound and wedged. The individual strips must be joined to form a continuous winding. An electric machine does this job, heating the strips until they fuse together. This particular generator will generate about 30,000 units of electricity per hour at 22,000 volts. And even this isn't enough for the distribution of power over long distances. Giant transformers are used to step up the voltage. This one will increase it to 132,000 volts. It takes 132,000 volts to feed the grid lines that transmit bulk supplies of electricity throughout the country. The complete transformer weighs over a hundred tons. When you're dealing with electricity on such a big scale, you've got to have special machinery to switch it on and off. This switchboard, part of a big installation job for Russia, is quite a small one. Each switch controls a mere 6,000 volts. 6,000 volts. About 25 times the voltage in your own home. All materials used in large-scale electrical supplies have to be tested in laboratories before they can be safely used. The engineer in charge in this high voltage test laboratory controls enormous forces. For this generator produces surges of more than two million volts, giving us some of the conditions of real lightning so that we can find out how to protect our electrical supply systems against it. Right, turn on the lightning. This insulator is made to stand up to 66,000 volts, but tests prove that it will stand far more. In fact, nearly half a million volts. That was electricity unharnessed. And now let's see what happens when you put it to work. Two separate groups work on the electrical machinery of industry. One installs it, the other keeps it in running order. Without these men, industry as we know it today would come to a standstill. Electricity has become an industry that has changed all industry. Go into an iron and steel works and you can watch electricity doing a hundred spectacular skilled jobs with speed and accuracy. 
Its power unloads pig iron or scrap into the white hot furnace. It measures and controls temperature, reliable, accurate, ensuring the quality of high-grade steels. Electricity drives the cradles that pour the liquid steel into molds. Here it is lifting a 10-ton ingot as easily as a cup of tea. Electrically controlled switches manipulate the blazing block of metal thinning it out finer and finer. Now the steel strip, travelling faster and faster, is ready to be scaled by the same electric power that has handled it through every stage from its liquid form till now. Electrically powered pumps spray it with water. Pressure on the steel can be adjusted by finger touch. As the strip leaves the last mill, its end is cut square by an electric guillotine. Travelling now at 30 miles an hour, it is a thousand foot strip, an eighth of an inch thick. It can leave the mill as one continuous strip, or by a simple adjustment of the controls, it can be cut into short lengths. Well, that's part of the job electricity does for part of industry. A basic part, for iron and steel is essential to most other industries. Now, for complete contrast, let's look at an electrical device that records not the tremendous temperatures of masses of metal, but the delicate workings of the human brain. This strip of paper is recording an electric message from the human brain made by a machine called the electroencephalograph. It has already been of great value in finding out more about mental disorders. But the best person to tell you about it is its designer, Mr. Gray Walter. Well, it's rather a tall order to tell you all about it, but uh, I can tell you something of how it works. Uh, this equipment is designed to record and amplify the electrical activity of the brain, which is derived from the electrodes here on the head of the subject, in this case, my son, and the activity is amplified 10 million times by the amplifiers here, of which there are four. And the activity is then transferred to the recording pens, which trace out a record of the electrical activity in the form of a very complicated line on paper. Now, this activity is so complicated that we can't read it directly. And we therefore have another instrument over here, which is called an analyzer. And this uh, breaks the record down into its parts and makes it possible for us to read a record of the brain's activity which would otherwise be far too complicated to read directly. Now, I'm afraid we only have time to show you one of the effects which this instrument is designed to display. I'm going to ask my son to do some sums in his head and you'll be able to see the brain almost literally working the sums out. On this paper, you can see two traces. Watch the bottom one only. When the brain is at rest, the needles will record a wavy line. But when the brain is active, the waves will alter in shape and get smaller. Watch. 
Do close your eyes, please, Irving. I'm going to give you some sounds to do in your head. Would you do them and give me the answer as soon as you can? Would you multiply four by three? Twelve. Good. Now will you multiply six by two? Twelve. Now will you multiply four by four? Sixteen. Good. Now will you multiply eight by three? Twenty-four. Thank you. Now you think of a nice rich ice cream. Night and day, the doctor and the surgeon use electricity to diagnose and to heal. Ultraviolet and other ray treatments. X-rays for seeing and for treating disease. Electricity is as vital to medicine as to industry. Well, there are many more categories I could pick out. They're all important, but uh, I tell you what, let's take a look at the lighter side of the industry. Quite a few of our members are connected with the entertainment industry. And a big proportion you'll find handling the lights needed in filming. In fact, uh, I've got a couple with me now. But most of them work in the studio. I expect you usually find them at Elstree or Pinewood or Denham. The film studio Sparks are the men who provide light for the cameraman. The highest paid stars in the world couldn't shine without them. They have their place in most forms of entertainment, stage, film, and the latest of them all, television. The television camera is, of course, all electric. And although the radio transmission of pictures has its limitations, it also has a flexibility of its own. Not so much in the conventional type of entertainment, but more in live interviews with famous personalities. And above all, in the outside broadcasts of current events at the time they're happening. Television is developing fast, and of all the branches of entertainment, none is so dependent on electricity as this entertainment of the future. And what of the future? Future? Well, all I have to do with the future is to keep enough blank index cards to cope with the growth of the electrical industry and the people in it. But if you want to do any crystal gazing, why not take a look at the crystals at the post office research station at Dollis Hill? If you pass a certain kind of electric current through specially selected types of quartz, the quartz, when cut in the right way, ground to the right shape and thickness, and mounted in a valve, will keep time more accurately for you than any other device yet known. These quartz valves are made at the GPO research station at Dollis Hill, where research on the present and future use of electricity is carried out. They are used in very complicated electrical apparatus for the measurement of time. Electrical quartz clocks, not for telling the time as we understand it, but for helping scientists to make important measurements with more accuracy than ever before. This is the only form of time measurement that can make accurate records of modern jet aircraft. The electronic stopwatch measures intervals of time as fleeting as one hundred thousandth of a second. The quartz clock is just one result of the work of the GPO scientists. Developments in telephone and wireless communication are achievements of the past. The vocoder is a marvel of the future. The vocoder is an experimental device for getting more phone calls on the same long distance cables. It analyzes human speech and turns it into a kind of electrical shorthand, which is quite unintelligible until fed into a second panel. It makes completely synthetic speech by means of electric vocal cords. In fact, it can speak for itself after a GPO scientist has provided the human speech for it to work on. In a few seconds, you'll hear my voice over the vocoder. 
Strictly speaking, it won't be my voice at all, but a synthetic reconstruction. Now here's a bit of Lewis Carroll, vocoderized. Will you please switch on the complete vocoder system? The sun was shining on the sea, shining with all its might, doing its very best to make the billows smooth and bright, and that was odd because it was the middle of the night. Now we'll disconnect the electrical vocal cord. And I'll recite some more Lewis Carroll. The result will be intelligible, but it'll sound as if I've got laryngitis. Now we'll switch in a constant pitch vocal cord instead of my own natural voice inflections. If seven maids with seven moths swept it for half a year, do you suppose the walrus said that they would get it clear? I doubt it, said the carpenter, and shed a bitter tear. Of course, there's no need to restrict ourselves to any particular pitch. If we gradually turn up the pitch control, we can make my voice appear to rise as high as we wish, making it sound like a true white woman. Or, on the other hand, we can make it lower than would be possible in any human voice. I think you'll agree that this is a lower than Electricity can perform miracles for you. It has been used in all phases of research on atomic energy. Here at Birmingham University is a cyclotron. This is the instrument which can do what is popularly known as splitting the atom. It was designed by Professor Oliphant, one of the team of British scientists who developed the atom bomb. Dr. Nimmo, lecturer in physics at the university, is going to tell you something about it. This is the cyclotron magnet. Above we have the ducting system that carries in cooling air and takes out the warm air after it has cooled the coils. The effect of the magnet is produced between those two pole pieces. The magnet is caused to operate by a current that flows through large copper coils, which you can see by looking into this window. There is one stack of coils on the lower pole piece and another stack on the upper one. I want to turn on the magnet. It will take a moment or two before the magnet is strong enough to give you a demonstration. By the way, have you taken off your watches? Yes. Good. Then let us start the generator. I mean about your watches? In such an exceptionally strong magnetic field as this, apart from the quite startling tricks you can play with iron and steel objects, such as these ball bearings, non-magnetic materials like this aluminium plate appear to defy the laws of gravity. But of course the cyclotron wasn't designed to do tricks like this. It's been popularly described as an atom smasher, and it certainly is used to knock pieces off atoms. The reason you have to have such massive apparatus to do this is that we know atoms consist of electric particles held together by enormous forces. The cyclotron is used to discover more about these forces which hold atoms together. To do this, it uses magnetism and electricity. Two D-shaped pieces of copper are used to apply the electrical force, the magnetic field you have already seen. These Ds, as they are called, fit into the magnetic field like this. But I can show you more clearly what happens with the diagram. When the cyclotron is working, the Ds are in a magnetic field. You can see what follows if we look at this from above. The Ds are connected with a source of electricity which alternates much more quickly, of course, than in this diagram. Next, a source of electric particles, similar to the filament in a radio valve, is arranged. And the combined effect of the electrically charged Ds and the magnetic field 
makes them move in a spiral. The bigger the spiral, the faster the particles. They leave the cyclotron traveling at 65 million miles an hour, and this speed is quite enough to knock bits off atoms. Of course, an atom is far too small to see, but we can show you how we think of them. Here is an atom of lithium. It consists of a central nucleus surrounded by three electrons. The electrons are evolving so quickly that this is a better impression. When you bombard this atom with a cyclotron beam, there is a relatively huge release of energy as it breaks down into two smaller atoms of helium. Well, that's all I have to tell you. That should give you some idea of what it's all about. Yes, it's all very interesting. Makes me feel terribly ignorant. But is all this going to give us housewives more electric irons and washing machines? After all, we can't all be scientists. Well, here's Professor Oliphant. Perhaps he would like to give you his views about that matter. Yes, it's quite true that we're not all scientists or housewives for that matter, but we are all citizens. If atomic energy is used for evil purposes, then it's your fault and my fault, fault of every one of us. You see, one pound of uranium can provide enough electrical energy to run an ordinary domestic iron for 3,000 years. If, the, if we, as citizens, through our governments, throw this energy away by making atomic bombs, then it's literally our own funeral. You see, you can't dodge this issue on a plea of ignorance. It's up to you and every citizen to understand something about atomic energy, about its power for good and evil, if civilization is going to endure at all. I am electricity. I can make life easier in a score of ways. My power drives the industries of the world ready at the touch of a switch. I have helped to reveal the secrets of the mind and to heal diseases of the body. I have brought entertainment to millions. I have given science instruments of miraculous fineness and inhuman accuracy. I have split the atom. I have a thousand uses. I can... Aye, and a fat lot of use you'd be without me to turn you on. What Professor Oliphant said was true. Electricity and atomic energy and all that lot are all wonderful things. Every time I use this screwdriver, I help to make someone's life more comfortable and more pleasant. But electricity won't turn itself on. We electricians, organized in the Electrical Trades Union, have found that even conditions of work and benefits we enjoy today have only been won through hard and bitter struggles, often against a hostile employer's class. Today we have an organization capable of defending what's already been won and of fighting for even better conditions. Every electrical worker ought to know something of how his trade union works. For only through understanding can we all hope to play our part in the hard struggles for the better life which lie ahead of us. The ETU is a national union with members in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. For administrative purposes, the country is divided into 19 areas. Each area elects a committee from the branches within its boundaries. The activities of the union are coordinated at the head office which employs a large administrative staff of typists, accountants, research workers, legal experts and specialists. The research department is of particular importance. The success of any wage claim or negotiation depends on accurate information and statistics. The weekly contribution of 140,000 members provides an annual income of many thousands of pounds and the efficient administration of these funds requires a skilled staff of accountants. The ETU is registered as an approved society and from its National Health Insurance section has made substantial contributions to its members. The union also provides accident, unemployment and death benefits as well as free legal aid to members and their dependents. Trade union democracy means that every member has the right to express his point of view. Your night for evening classes, isn't it? Yes. 
Well, don't you think you'd better get going? I think I'll give it a miss tonight. Still got time to make it if you hurry. I don't have to go, do I? No, but this'll be the second night you've missed this week. Well, it's a waste of time when I do go. How do you mean? Well, I get so damn tired I feel more like going to sleep. I leave home at seven in the morning, don't get back till six, swallow me tea and then dash off to evening classes. I don't get a chance to breathe. I know it makes a long day. Be you know, keen your mother and I That's are. That's all very well, but why don't the firm give us time off for technical classes? After all, it's for their benefit in the end. They ought to. Plenty of other firms do. Matter of fact, we were talking about that the other night at the branch. Why can't the union do something about it then? After all, you don't feel like studying in the evening after a hard day's work. Tell you what I'll do. I'll raise it at the next branch meeting. What good can the branch do? They can do quite a lot once they get cracking. You come along with me next week and see for yourself. Yes, the branch can do a lot of good. It's the cornerstone of all union activity. It's at the branch that the rank and file thresh out their problems. Any issue, such as this question of time off for apprentices attending technical classes, can be discussed at the member's own branch. In this case, the meeting decides to send a resolution to the Executive Council, asking them to approach the employers on the subject. The resolution duly reaches head office and is laid before the Executive Council. The Executive Council consists of 11 members who work at the trade and are not paid officials as well as the General President, the General Secretary, and the Assistant General Secretary. It is responsible for the general management and control of the Union. Each member has been elected by his appropriate division, and collectively, they discuss and decide all major questions of policy and administration, in accordance with the rules. This question of apprentices' training is only one of perhaps a hundred matters referred to them at each meeting for guidance and action. But the important thing is, that the democratic structure of the Union can be used by every member. This is how the machinery works. An ordinary member can go to his shop steward, or he can go to his branch. Both the shop steward and the branch can go direct to the area committee. The area committee can refer to the executive council, and the Executive Council, in its turn, is guided by the decisions of the annual Delegate Conference. The rank-and-file member who wants his point of view expressed at the annual conference can do so directly through his branch. The Delegate Conference is held every year, and every five years it can revise the rules of the Union. This conference is the highest authority in the Union where all matters of policy are decided. The delegates to the conference are elected on a divisional basis and must be members working in the industry. Full-time officials are not eligible for election as delegates, nor are the Executive Council, although they attend and take part in the debates without voting rights. The delegate conference is the Parliament of the Union. The agenda contains resolutions covering all kinds of subjects, local, national and international. For trade unionists are not only interested in their immediate bread and butter problems. As citizens of the world, they claim the right to help to shape the world to their own desires. In the words of Brother E. W. Buzzy, The electrical trade union seeks to place electricity at the service of mankind. This will be fully realized only when electricity has become the property of the people then it will indeed have become the source of life and power, of light and liberty, the power that will lift mankind from the realms of necessity to the sphere of freedom.